you know, for me, it was like, okay, maybe I, I come to decisions quickly, maybe a bit more first of personality, great at a startup. You add people on, you guys start making space for their decision making. The hardest thing is when you guys swing the pendulum back again and be like, okay, but I also need to be able to make some decisions. So that, that can be a tough thing as well. Right. Thanks for your patience, everyone. Very excited to join you today. So my name is Anthony Taylor. I'm the host of the Strategy and Leadership Podcast today. I have Mike McDermott from uh, FreshBook. Mike, how are you today? I'm well, thanks, Anthony. Thanks for hanging in there. And those of you who have uh, uh, waited uh, patiently, I think I'm the root cause for being a little behind. So anyhow, I'm delighted to be here. Well, you know, that's kind of like the world that we live in is that we have our best laid plans and then we join everything together as best as possible, which is probably a very uh, great way to think about your journey. So why don't you tell a little bit, our listeners, a little bit about you and, and how you got to where you are right now, and then I'll ask you a little bit more. Sure. Um, so my name is Mike. I'm one of the founders of, of Fresh Books and um I was really, I guess I, I was our, a longtime CEO. I've recently transitioned from that role. Uh, we'll talk about that. But long story, story short, founder, and, and I was running a design firm, and I saved over an invoice. Uh, I was using Word and Excel to bill my clients and decided after doing that, uh, saving over that invoice, that there just had to be a better way to do this. And at the time, people were buying boxes of software at Staples and, and things like this and installing it with a CD on their computer. Uh, I decided to build something, you know, in what is now called the cloud. It was a simple web application for those of you who are maybe a little more technical. It doesn't really matter. It was on the internet. And um, uh, we we loved what we were doing. We had really no commercial success in the first few years. Two years in, we had 10 customers paying us, but $9.95 a month each. And, you know, that's $100 a month. And my co-founders were an electrical engineer and a doctor of, you know, computer science. So we, we weren't really succeeding. Um, <laughs> But we loved what we were doing and we had a ton of people using the service and talking to us and we just we loved hearing what they had to say and they gave us all kinds of ways for how we could improve and so really working with our customers and 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 you know frankly developing ourselves we we learned how to build software build a brand build a company and went from uh, three people in a basement to uh, over 600 people today and uh, number two in um in sort of America, and forgive me, I'm a, a Canadian. I'm guessing some other Canadians are on the show, but uh, you know, we're a global global company paying customers to 100 countries. Number two in America for small business uh, accounting software in the cloud, and so proud to have uh, you know gotten to this point, and uh, lots of lots of room to run still as we uh, as we expand globally uh, these days from our, our headquarters in Toronto. That's awesome. Well, I mean, it's been it's been such a journey from from literally basement to to billion dollar company. Uh, in those years that you were starting up, you know, what were some of the things that you had to tell yourself to to keep yourself going, to keep yourself motivated, and and to you know keep engaged? Because I know that there's a lot of CEOs uh, that listen to our podcast where you know on any given day they're getting sued or, you know, their customers aren't paying or their staff is, you know, mutinizing, like what kept you going in those challenging times? Well, I think, I think one thing we always did really well, and I encourage anyone to do is um, we were always really close with our customers. What that meant is we were easy to reach and we we're hearing from them all the time. And so, you know, we had basically no monetary success. <laughs> But we could tell from speaking with people that they loved what we were doing and we loved talking with them and were highly motivated to serve them better and better every single day. And so I think that was the thing that got me going. I, the things, I mean, I was terrified of being squashed by multi billion dollar companies that were leaders in the space. I was um, scared to pieces of venture capitalists who I thought knew all this stuff I didn't know. And I feared they would, like, if we ever raised money from them, like, take the company away and ruin it and all this kind of stuff. And uh, so I had lots, you know, lots keeping me up at night. Plus I, I knew nothing about building a, a product company. I had built a, a small services company. And so, you know, there was so much I didn't know, uh, you know, on so many dimensions for so long that it was, you know, really overwhelming often. Uh, but, uh, but also that, you know, that was also part of the fun of it because, yeah, it forces you to challenge yourself and to push through. And, and when you get on the other side of that, it's like, oh, I can do more, you know, mm -hmm. and 
look, look at back at that. I, I made it. And, you know, through that week of the journey and then here comes the next train and let's do it all over again. So, yeah. Was there like a turning point throughout that that went from like, hey, our customers are driving us to the success is driving us or, you know, a couple like ahas along the way, maybe multiple turning points? I, you know, personally, I believe, you know, we're sort of this 10 plus year overnight success story in some people's eyes. It, it, to me, success is, I mean, some people are really good at storytelling, I guess, and they'll pick, you know, one thing and say that was it. But, you know, if I really understand any one of those stories, it was, you know, a million small decisions that led, led to that moment. And I, I really think that's what it's about. It, it's, you have to do so many things you know, the right way for the right reason when nobody's looking to have the opportunity to, um, to you know, to do the right thing when somebody is. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, that that to me is is the heart of things is, is knowing where you're going, know why you're, you're doing it, stay true to your your values and, and uh, you know, trust, trust it's going to work out. Hmm. Can you, um, what was actually, what was some of the best advice that you got as you were growing in your leadership? Because obviously, you know, as a guy who's just trying to figure out a, a company and you're like, okay, I just need to get my product market fit. And then you started adding headcount. What were like, what was like one of a big lessons that you could share with our listeners about um, developing in that leadership and, and being able to build the foundation for that growth? Well, you know, given you're talking about product market fit and all this, sounds like you know something about technology and software, and I trust your audience does as well. What, what I would like to share with you is those turns of phrase did not exist when I got going. Like <laughs> we had to figure out, you know, through first principles and intuition, like you know what a customers want. And, you know, minimum viable product was not a was not a thing. Like we had to discover that by making mistakes of building too much, and then. Um, you know, there was, I will say that folks at 37 signals were great with kind of do less. And I was like, I understand that we can, we can replicate that and uh, just do a little bit less, improve things. And you, you sort of iterate. So um, I, I think, you know, that's closer to the truth than, um, you know, some sort of master, uh, <laughs> master plan. So I, I, and forgive me if I like, hopefully that answers the question. I've kind of forgotten what the question was. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it sounds like, um, from from your experience, so one of the great things about getting to hear people's stories and how they got to it is being able to take away, you know, the, the, the secret ingredients, you know, some of the secret ingredients I kind of hear, although they're not so, so secret is, you know, it sounds like a lot of consistency. It sounded like a lot of like the little things like giving oh. extra effort. Um, right. It also sounds like you know, it, it was a, a fairly organic process and also like listening to, to customers. Um, and, and what I find coaching CEOs that are in that situation, they have, you know, 20 or 30 things on their desk. And sometimes it's, you know, just that one sort of mind shift of how to approach the, the challenge, which can make a big difference in terms of yeah. how they can successfully overcome it. I, I think those early stages, you know, one of the things I you know, I didn't know this was a good thing, but I think I, I did well was I collected advisors. And so I would, and I was pretty good about laying myself bare and calling them up and being like, okay, these are all the things I don't know today. You know, can, can you help me? And it wasn't, you know, drama. It was like, I just don't know how to do this. And so one of the pieces of advice I got was, um, you know, focus is a four letter word. And, and what that means is, you know, if you don't focus, you'll be stepping in a lot of four letter words. Uh, and so uh, what that means is you have to shorten your to-do list and you need to execute and get a smaller number of things done um, and just move forward. And so that was that was big because often those of us, I, I would say I'm very much an entrepreneur and we talk at length about why I believe that if you want, but uh, sparing you that conversation, uh, I, I see opportunity in a lot of directions and it was hard to stick with what we were doing. And it was hard, you know, we had times where it felt like people were discovering us online. All these opportunities were coming forward. Could be, you know, people want to invest, people want to partner or what have you. And that was, you know, you might say, oh, you're a success at that point. Believe me, we were not a success. We were like four people in a basement at that point in time. And, you know, really no revenue to speak of and no clue what we were doing. Um, but we said we said no to a lot of those things. And, and the power to know that you can say no um, so that you can say, you know, to focus, like I, I came up with this ratio. I don't know if it's true exactly, but 27 to one, you have to say no, like 27 times 
So you can say yes once because all these little yeses distract you from where you really need to go. And the power of saying no, especially as a company gets going or you get going is is so important because it enables focus, it enables progress. And it also helps you once you have some fo- you have some momentum going, you have a clearer sense of of what it is that's you know going to make you, you know, th- what it is is going to make you successful if you had the bandwidth to say yes to it. Uh, yeah. Hey, sorry to interrupt. It's Anthony here again. I just wanted to let you know if you're enjoying today's episode, I'd love it if you could give us a review and a comment to let us know where you're listening from. It means a lot to us. It helps us with the algorithm. It also helps us get into the hands of more people so that we can keep bringing great guests onto the show. So please do that. Also, if you or your team are planning a strategic planning offsite coming up, please reach out to us. We'd be happy to see if we're a fit to facilitate to support you and your team getting on the same page and getting clear about where you want to go. So you can visit smestrategy.net or click the link in the description. We'd appreciate both of those things. And now get us back to the episode. So uh, along that um, yes, no journey, what did you practically do to get your leadership on board with that mentality? Like, were you able to just like autocratically say like, hey, I'm, I'm making the final call here? Or was there certain things that you need to do uh, from a structural and systems basis to get your team thinking strategically about that? Because it's not evident to everybody. And a lot of people just want to get pulled in a bunch of directions. So how did you manage that on a day-to-day basis? Yeah, so you're taking me back to the basement. And we were a pretty small team. And I was probably, um, you know, not that people were passengers, but probably, uh, you know, probably just whether sheer force of personality or whatever it was, pro- probably the one leading. And I was trying to more listen and get guidance because I kind of thought everyone in the room was more successful than me, mm-hmm. uh, you know, at that stage and maybe still is in, in many ways. So I was trying to, they had done other things and, you know, and sometimes it was like, hey, we can't do everything or, or you know, which one of these things are we going to do and force trade-offs get presented to you. So I, I think that was, uh, and then for the buy-in, um, you know, I, I think that, that again, like, I would say learning how to get shared buy-in and those things came to me later in my journey as the team, you know, got larger. And uh, also where I, I think one of the hardest ones was, you know, for me, it was like, okay, maybe I, I come to decisions quickly, maybe a bit more first of personality. Great at a startup, you add people on, you got to start making space for their decision-making. The hardest thing is when you got to swing the pendulum back again and be like, okay, but I also need to be able to make some decisions. So that, that can be a tough thing as well. Um, yeah, especially when they're like important strategic decisions where, you know, you're trying to do things collaboratively, you try and involve everybody, but ultimately you got to make a call, decide, move on. And I, I think, I think that balance between having people feel like they are heard and involved, um, and then, you know, you making a decision and moving on and not, you know, doing it in a way that's offensive, but also not you know, feeling like you're compromising and we're not getting where we want to go as fast or as well as we could. Like that's, that's a hard dynamic. Sometimes still wrestle with it today. Yeah. Cause I can see that. I mean, at, at the size of that you guys are, you know, it's both one way easier because you've made your own lane in a way, but then there's still like other opportunities. I imagine, you know, the conversation of uh, getting sold or bought. I, I don't know if that's happened in your, your journey to, with other organizations. Have you ever had to go through that challenge of, you know, offered being purchased? That That's always a big one, right? They, they come around, they have throughout the years um, and mostly, you know, just a very long-term mindset, believe the company is, you know, able to be its own thing for a long, long time. And so it's, you know, like, never woken up and been like, Hey, this is a company we need to sell like in the morning. That's not how I, I feel, but yeah, as you get more stakeholders and whatever, more points of view to be considered for sure. Um, that that's like an existential one that's getting into like, you know, deep founder territory, I think. And I think, Hey, are you a CEO? Are you a founder? Those are different hats. Sometimes you have to wear both like, Hey, this is how I feel about it. You know, as a CEO who, you know, we raised a bunch of money, we got stakeholders in there. You have to be able to, you know, basically look, look at it the same thing a few different ways and try and be intellectually honest about um, the, the, the different, different outcomes you might get to um, when you use those different lenses. Yeah, absolutely. So I guess there's, you know, there's the founder lens, there's the CEO lens, there's the leader lens and the person wor- working forward. So um, I, I read somewhere that you advocate uh, 
Oh, hopefully I'm still here. You advocate uh, blind dates for your employees. Is that, uh, I don't know which, which one of those lenses you take on that, but can you explain the blind dates for your employees? It's a, it's a like, so one of the things you need to do well in a startup um, is uh, you need to get attention. Okay. And we spent a lot of time in the early days of the company thinking about how can we be interesting so people will take interest in us and write about us and all this stuff. And so uh, this blind dates thing, it's, it's great to hear you present it like that because it's an example of someone on the team who, uh, you know, re really, um, you know, found a headline way to get people's attention to do something that's far more mundane, uh, but also very important. So one, one thing we got into was as the company grew, um, it's, it's a great story. We had a woman, our first support person who joined the company and she's still with us today. And that's kind of like, I don't know, 15 plus years later, <clears throat> everyone who joins the company goes to support and spends their first month there. And so she would meet everybody. And as we grew one day, she realized that, you know, she knew everybody, but not everybody knew everybody else. And she said to herself, what can I do about this? Because I love knowing everybody, everybody should know everybody, but they don't. And, and so she, she basically, went to the company and said, hey, listen, if you'd like to meet somebody who you don't normally bump into, let me arrange a, a coffee date for you. And so we called them blind dates. Um, they were usually two or three people. Uh, they, they didn't really have any romantic, uh, you know, aspect to them. Uh, it was more, you know, trying to get people from different parts of the company to spend time together, to build connective tissue, to understand what's going on, to learn from each other. And it's something we, we did for years. And I don't know, if people might use the donut app in Slack. And I think that's, you know, something if you're in a company you can use, or maybe it's something we built and I don't even know it. But uh, that just kind of assembles random meetings of people. Uh, so like each week you could have a meeting with a group of people who you've never met before in the company. And that is a, that is a very good thing to do. Mm, absolutely. So what it, now in 2021, uh, what are some of the things that you're doing within the company to, uh, or what are some of the things that you've done recently to support that collaboration communication, especially, I mean, through COVID, it's been a, a challenge getting people engaged and happy. What are some of the things that you've done that have been, successful uh, to keep people sort of motivated, focused, and engaged? I'll, I'll talk about a couple of things with some, some real recency. So um, today I did a thing called office hours, which we didn't start doing until the pandemic, which was basically having, a, I do it biweekly now. We did it weekly right after the pandemic, but anyone in the company can join. It's an hour. It's just open q and A. I mean, that sounds really simple. People have office hours, but, you know, it's pretty easy to forget. That could be a nice thing to do in the pandemic. So people just feel like they can come up to you or they can even go and listen, hear about, you know, I don't present anything there. It's all question driven. Uh, and so I'll, I'll answer questions, but I give people a lot of context. You have people with us, been with us for seven years. People have been with us seven months on, on the in the, the, the session. And so it's, um, you know, that is a thing. And then interestingly, um, we were talking about donut app and blind dates today in that because someone was like, Hey, um, you know, I went on a donut app thing a while ago. And, and by the way, uh, seems like it might be broken at FreshBooks right now. So we got to reinstitute it or I, I have a to do to go figure out what, what happened to that. Um, but the, the point is, I, I think like doing something like the donut app is a thing. And increasingly right now, I, I mean, I think like so many people, we kind of figured the pandemic would um, <clears throat> not necessarily be going on at this point in time. Uh, and that, you know, looking at like we probably have another certainly three, maybe six months still to go in, in terms of and hopefully you know, outside of work, we may not be in the office, but other amenities and stuff like that are relatively more open and not totally locked down. That would be a, a good outcome at this stage. Um, but but it's almost been two years of like a, a company of hundreds of people working remotely, never meeting each other, growing fast. Um, and so we're spending some time. We're a values driven organization. We have nine values. Um, and one of them, uh, you know, is uh, defined as we're playful and we make time for fun. Uh, it's our it's our fun value, uh, and we're we're doing a bunch of work right now. Just remind people, hey, you have the agency to go ahead and spend time with people, and we encourage you to do it. Um, and so, ideally, and do it sort of regularly. I think sometimes it's like let's do a big company, everybody get together, kind of like no. I think what people need to be doing right now is is very much with their team and maybe an adjacent team, and that is the thing to get through the pandemic. 
Uh, and maybe you work for yourself and you want to find some people to, you know, just book a coffee meeting with or something like that. Or, or you're a CEO and you need some community because you feel isolated. You don't have either a management team or a board that, you know, you feel like that's the, the group and you find some other CEOs that you just get together regularly with. I think it's, it's a very important thing at this time. Not that we need another Zoom meeting, but some sense of community is a, is a critical thing. And it's something that's really been lost with, you know, fewer kind of meetups or events after work and, um, and uh, you know, less ability to just sit with people all day long. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so for you in your position and looking forward, either within or without uh, COVID, what, what are some of the things that are challenging you? Like what's at the top of your list that's like, oh, I haven't been able to like work through this yet. What is challenging you in, in a positive way that sort of makes you stretch your brain because as a company if you've got to a billion dollars as valuation like that's pretty damn good like is there something next or are you reflecting on something different uh, believe it or not there are I'm, I'm i have an interesting back basket of things now which is really fun like hey like there's a lot of platform planning we still need to do um you know when you think about our size and scale and the the, the software platform we're building a global small business accounting software there's like decades of work to do so that that is a thing i spend time on I increasingly spend time, you know, helping people, you know, in the company and, you know, uh, think about, hey, what what are places we might want to buy a company and why? And then also working often with the founding teams on the other side to be like, oh, let me help you understand, you know, what this looks like, who we are, all that good stuff. So a lot of corporate development stuff. But I think that the first thing that came to mind when you said that is um, FreshBooks is a, a remarkable place, a great culture. We do some really nice things in our community, you know, with like local food banks and, and things of this nature and, and often supporting our customers, whether over the years we've done all kinds of stuff where there's been a flood in an area and like FreshBookers themselves will like donate money to a cause. So I think we're, you know, in a lot of ways trying to do the right thing all the time. And we have a thing where everyone at the company can have three days off to get involved with a, a charitable activity of, of their own interest. But what I will say is I don't think we have, you know, collectively made the impact that we can as a company. Um, you know, we happen to be a company that doesn't have a, you know, as large an environmental footprint as some other industries. We, you know, data centers that we use are kind of already green offset in, in many ways, but I'm keen to see, you know, how might we, how might we go further on the um, on on sort of helping and contributing in that way? And that as a founder is really fun because that's you know big positive impact for hundreds of people and you know hundreds of countries. Um, that is uh, that is that is an exciting thing for me, and I think it's early days for us maxing that out. Hmm. Interesting. Um, well, that's cool. I mean, that's kind of the part of like sending the elevator back down and using your your powers for for good and not evil. So it's cool to hear you say that both as a Canadian company and, and as a company in the in the total landscape. Um, so you know, we started. You talked about your company when it was in a basement. Product market fit didn't even exist. You've grown it to this place where now you're considering the platform, you know, putting all of these kind of pieces together, really supporting your clients and supporting the small business landscape. Um, what do you see next in the in the industry, whether that's the software industry as a whole, whether that's for small businesses in general? Like, you know, what are some of the trends that you're seeing that we can, um, you know, share with our audience so they can start thinking, you know, longer term 2022, 2023? I I believe uh, the pandemic has gone and accelerated, you know, the move to things being done differently. Let's call it that way. Some people would say, hey, digitally is a big part of that. But uh, it, when you think of how people procure food and maybe they click a button and, you know, I think we dine in more now uh, if you're in a city city and we have small kids where you don't have to necessarily make meals. Or by the way, I think even the buying of prepared meals from a supermarket is different. And so I, I just think there's some really big changes in the way um, humans go about some pretty standard things like grocery shopping now is like place order online, you know, sit in car box goes in, you know, thank you very much. Like, I don't know if that's going to go away. And so I think one of the things, and this isn't particularly related to FreshBooks, but I, I think we probably have all underestimated the knock-on implications of these behavior changes. I think there's probably a lot of opportunities out there. Um, some of them are like, hey, things are going digital. Um, and so we have professions in our customer base that are sort of benefiting from that transition. Um, you know, there's a lot of 
time coming back into the world because people aren't commuting to work anymore. Like there's there's just a lot of subtle things. And and um, well, anyhow, so I, I think some of the behavior changes are very interesting, just kind of workforce and you know, non-workforce set of things that, that are going to create opportunities that are going to be good for a lot of people. Cool. And then as as we you know sort of wrap up today, as you think of some of those both benefits and challenges, what are some of the sort of like words of wisdom you'd give to our you know managers and leaders as they take on leading in this in this new environment? Um, I, I think in many ways, uh, leading has never been more thankless than it is today. Um, you know, you, you don't get to, you know, see the smile on the face necessarily or have somebody pull you aside after you did a thing and say, thank you for doing that the same way it's where it comes as like an emoticon on Slack or something like this. Like it's it is, you know, as a leader, I think just just recognize the, the time that we're in. I think most leaders don't do it, you know, to get the praise or the outcome or what have you. But, you know, I, I would say, hey, you know, recognize it's probably been never been a, a less thankless thing. And you forget about yourself and think about all those people who are leading for and around you and think about, you know, if you know it's the most thankless time ever, you know, don't let them go another minute without, you know, feeling like they're valued and, and finding a way to support them through this because it's it's exhausting. You know, it's uncertain. It's isolating. It's all these things. And I think, um, you know, to me, leadership is is something that is sadly more scarce in the world as we become, you know, more um, individualistic in a lot of ways. And, uh, you know, that that to me is uh, kind of a, a sad thing. Duty is less of a thing. You know, personal success can be more of a thing. And I, you know, I, I think leadership is is super valuable. There's things in the world that just don't happen without a lot of it. And, um, you know, and, uh, and, you know, and it's, it's hard to keep it going sometimes in, in these kinds of conditions. So I'd say, remember that, you know, if not for yourself, then for those around you, and, and I think you will be rewarded uh, for doing so. Yeah, that's awesome. It's one of the things I've, I've seen from people is the line between work and personal has been blurred. So it's very easy to like lead at work and put it all on the table and come back and I don't want to say suffer in silence, but have to take that home. And then now it's it's one. And like you really get like that thankless leadership. It's like, yeah, because they're doing that on top of being a parent or being a kid and being like a community, like it's all one thing. And, and you know, everybody is so stressed personally that it's hard to sort of like give back and, and like have that cup being full. So being aware of any time anybody's, you know, pouring from their cup to, to recognize it. I think that's a really great takeaway, Mike. Um, so just as we finish up here, anything else you want to share with our leaders, including how they can get a hold of you and how they can learn more about FreshBooks? Yeah, well, thank you for tuning in and hearing all this out. Um, I, um, you know, probably best way on social media is just at Mike McDermott at, at Twitter. Having said that, um, I would encourage you to the extent you're running a, a firm that <laughs> and sends invoices, needs to track expenses, all that good stuff to check out uh, to check out FreshBooks, and you can do that and get a free trial going at FreshBooks.com. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, uh, short of that, just uh, um, uh, you know, Godspeed in whatever it is that you're doing. And you know, to the extent you're feeling tired, to the extent you know it's a challenge, please know that everyone else is is there with you and and you know they may be silently there with you but uh um you are you are not alone uh, and to keep on going awesome mike i appreciate that and the podcast is not sponsored by fresh books but they have such a super clean platform so do check it out i really like like the ux of it is very high so uh mike dermot thank you so much for um coming on today oh it looks like we're going to drop a link for the free trial of fresh books in here so check it out in the uh, in the description but mike thank you so much for joining us it's been a pleasure chatting my pleasure yeah thank you thanks everyone i appreciate you being here thanks to my guest mike uh this has been the strategy and leadership podcast if you know somebody who would benefit from this podcast please be sure to share it their way and once again thanks for joining us we'll see you next time on the next episode of the strategy and leadership thanks so much Bye, everyone.